In our first funny story of the week, we bring you a hilarious story about cannibals and a father and his son that is sent to go and hunt for the tribe's next victim. In today's funny story, we bring you a hilarious tale of a tropical island where cannibals still roam. So, get ready for a roller coaster ride of laughs that will bring you to the punchline of the century. This island was well known for its tribe of cannibals and was very seldom visited by tourists, for obvious reasons. Now, even though this island had the occasional unsuspecting tourist making landfall, it would always turn out to be a one-way ticket, for the tourist, of course. The tourists, however, have been very scarce of late. As was their custom, they had an annual festival coming up where they revisited their cannibal heritage, and a subject for this feast had to be found to feed all the tribal chief's subjects. The tribal chief called a father and son to send them on a very important hunting expedition. I need you to go hunting in the forest for food for the tribe's annual festival. This is a very important mission, and I want you to get the best meat available. So, the father and son traveled deep into the forest, where they set up a hunting hide next to a small footpath, waiting for an unsuspected victim. A short while later, a skinny old man came walking down the footpath. The son, very enthusiastic, turns to the dad and said, Dad, let's get this one. I'm sure the whole tribe can all eat from this one. The father, not very impressed with what he sees, said to his son, My boy, that one will just not do. It has too little meat on it for the whole tribe. It's old and won't taste so nice, and the dogs won't even have enough bones as leftovers. So no, we are not going to eat that one. The old man was left alone to wonder on, and a bit later a very chubby woman came walking down the footpath. The son, now much more eager than the first time, said to his dad, Dad, surely this one has enough meat to feed everyone. We can even have an after party with this one. It will also fry nicely if there are any leftovers. The father, again not very impressed with what he sees, said to his son, My boy, that one will also not do. For starters, it's very heavy to carry all the way back to the tribe. However, my main concern is that she might not have the healthiest meat. I would never forgive myself if some members of the tribe gets heart attacks from eating such fatty meat. I just think we should rather wait for something better. Now obviously, the son was getting irritated with his father's patience, but agrees to wait a bit longer. A short bit later, a beautiful healthy woman came walking down the footpath. Both the father and the son get a grin on their face. The son, now as eager as he have ever been, said to his dad, Dad, this one can have no problems. She's young, the meat must be very tasty, and we will be able to feed the whole tribe. There will even be enough leftovers for the dogs. The dad, grinning from ear to ear, said to his son, My boy, yes, we can take this one. However, we will not eat this one. The son, just very confused, asks his father, So, dad, why will we take this one and then you say we cannot eat her? I just don't understand. The father, with an evil grin on his face, said to his son. My son, this one we will take home and then we will eat your mother. <laughs> In our next funny story, we have an alien encounter of the funniest kind. This funny story is light years in the making, and the punchline is magic. All right, folks, in today's funny story, we bring you a tale of interstellar misunderstandings so epic, it'll have you snorting space dust. Our story begins light years away, on a planet called Zorb. We will bring you a crack team of alien negotiators, crash landing on a far off planet called Earth, tasked with a mission of cosmic importance. Apparently, Earthlings have developed some doohickey that's throwing a galactic wrench into their whole way of life. Earth, the barbaric planet they'd only heard nightmarish rumors about, has apparently creating some sort of Wi-Fi wave that was giving their tentacle-based internet a serious case of the hiccups. These three Zorboids, 
exquisitely dressed in shimmering jumpsuits, think disco ball meets astronaut, were on a mission. Now, these aliens aren't your average green blobs with ray guns. They come from a planet where societal hierarchy is everything. Their leader, the supreme leader Glork, is a being so feared and revered, planets tremble at his mere voice. Or at least, that's the official story. Negotiation was key. These Zorboids, Zork, Blork, and their intern, Flork, still learning the difference between a space probe and a space probe for your breakfast, were the elite diplomatic squad. After a near-death experience with a black hole that smelled suspiciously like burnt toast, they finally reached Earth. Landing wasn't exactly smooth. Their spaceship, resembling a giant chrome avocado, sputtered and coughed its way down, crash landing in the most unleader-like place imaginable, Farmer Jack's pasture. Now, Zorboids had studied Earth through blurry satellite images, but let's just say their intel was a tad lacking. Their high-tech life-form detector, basically a glorified Roomba with disco lights, beeped excitedly. The first life form it picked up? A particularly grumpy-looking cow chewing on cud. Zork, brandishing a space blaster that looked like a high-tech potato peeler, approached the bovine with all the authority of a space emperor. Earthling. He boomed in his voice translator, which kept getting stuck on a bad Elvis impersonation. Take us to your leader. The cow, unimpressed by this glittery interloper, simply blinked and continued its leisurely munching. Zork, Blork, and Flork, who was desperately trying not to giggle, exchanged bewildered glances. Surely their leader wouldn't be some bovine buffoon. Next up on the life form detector, a flock of sheep. The Zorboids, ever hopeful, repeated their demand. The sheep, in their own silent rebellion, simply shuffled a few feet away and resumed their grass-chomping duties. Our heroes were starting to sweat or, well, secrete a concerning amount of green goo under their jumpsuits. Finally, the detector picked up a life form with even less dignity. A scrawny chicken pecking at the dirt outside a rickety farmhouse. Zork, at his wit's end, bellowed. Enough of this avian charade. Lead us to your leader, Earth scum. The chicken, bless its tiny feathered heart, just kept pecking. Defeat hung heavy in the air thicker than the stench of fermented space berries Zork had packed for the trip. Dejected, they stumbled towards the farmhouse, its peeling paint and crooked chimney a testament to its unique charm. The hinged door, which took them a good ten Earth minutes to figure out, whooshed open, revealing a scene that would make any intergalactic diplomat faint. A human, clad in stained overalls and sporting a suspicious amount of nose hair, was sprawled on a couch glued to a glowing rectangle that emitted flickering images of men in brightly colored padded suits tackling each other. In his other hand, he clutched a container filled with a suspicious amber liquid. Now, Zorboids prided themselves on their adaptability, but this, this was uncharted territory. To get this leader's attention, they did the only logical thing. They stood directly in front of the glowing rectangle. The human, momentarily startled, looked around them with an expression that could only be described as mildly inconvenienced. Can I help you, fellas? He drawled in a voice that sounded like gravel being chewed. After a frantic exchange of clicks and whistles, their translator was officially on the fritz, Zork managed to sputter out, We, we demand to speak with your leader. The human, completely unfazed, shoved them aside with surprising strength and resumed watching his sporting event. Just then, a loud engine noise ripped through the air. The human shot up, a look of pure terror replacing his previous apathy. Oh no, he muttered. She's early. In a whirlwind of activity, the leader transformed his living room. Beer cans vanished, replaced by decorative pillows. He even managed to squeeze into a slightly stained shirt and apply a suspicious green goo under his armpits. Was this some barbaric earth custom? Just as the house was spick and span, a car screeched to a halt outside. The Zorboids, bewildered, have never experienced this type of fear anywhere in the galaxy. 
They watched as the human sprinted towards the front door and shouted, Hi, honey, you are home early. As Mildred, Farmer Jack's wife, enters the house, the Zorbians pushing all the buttons on their voice translator, bow down respectfully and said, Extreme Supreme Leader, we come in peace. In the following funny story, we have a son with some marriage problems, seeking some advice from his father. In today's funny story, we bring you Farmer Jack trying to assist his married son with some marriage problems. It's a hilarious and funny story with an even better punchline. So sit back and enjoy the ride of the marital process from the perspective of a car. So Farmer Jack was working on his car when his married son come to complain about his wife. The father said, Well, my boy, let me try and explain married life in comparison with this car. The boy acknowledged that this was going to be an interesting discussion. Now, the boy wants to know what car, or woman for that matter, his father preferred when he was still young. Well, the father starts to explain that when he was young, and he can vividly remember it, walking past the new car dealership, looking at the beautiful new cars, was like looking at the lovely ladies at a party. Everything was so nice, it smelled so nice, and you could imagine driving one of those cars for many years. You could not imagine ever getting tired of taking her for a drive. Some of those cars was every young man's dream. There obviously were very expensive and beautiful cars, and ladies, sports cars, and then basic family cars. And then there was the workhorses, the pickups. These things could go everywhere, any time of day, but they were just too expensive, and no young man could afford them. And what car would you say, Dad? Was Mom like? The father looked around to see if the coast was clear, and then whispered as he continued to explain to his son. When he was a young man and early in his career, he couldn't really pick and choose so much, because you were just too happy with what you could afford. But a new car, he explained, was worth the investment. He could still clearly remember the day he made his decision on that small car. He could not sleep at night. He could only think about having that car as his own. Some men were obviously happy to drive used cars, but that was not the father's thing. He imagined driving long distances with his new car, traveling the country and so many more. He could learn about the engine, polish it on weekends and look well after it. But he had to wait until I had the finances to afford it, because buying a car, or getting married for that matter, was very expensive. But he eventually managed to do it. So what you are telling me, Dad, is that Mom was like a new entry-level small car. It had all the features, you know. Affordable, reliable, fuel efficient, enough space at that time, long service intervals and low on maintenance. And the styling was very cute for the era. Now tell me, Dad, how did things change through the years? The father continued by explaining that his son and his brother obviously destroyed the interior. He did not wash the car that much anymore. It didn't smell like a new car anymore. And the maintenance bills just kept creeping up. So the vehicle almost started to become unaffordable. It was making weird noises, had a lot of rattles, and the farmer battled a lot of times to get it started. This was a frustrating period for the farmer. I can imagine that it is about where you are now, in your married life. The son shook his head in acknowledgement. So, the father continued, it's at that stage of the farmer's life he started to think he should have waited a bit and got something more durable, like a pickup. He started to think of getting rid of the vehicle, but he had too many good memories and she still did the job efficiently. At least she was still reliable. The bumper looked like it had a lot of hail damage. The body was a bit rusted, but it still did the day-to-day -day jobs very well. Now at that stage of my life, I started looking at my friends. They all were starting to get new cars, or wives for that matter, large pickups, sports cars, and much more. It all seems to look so nice. The farmer continued that he fortunately decided to wait it out and see how things unfolded. In the meantime, 
he started to take old Trustworthy for a total rebuild. The body was new and gleamy, the engine was overhauled, and everything was done as when it was new. And would you believe it, my boy? It drove almost as well as when it was new. All she ever needed was a bit of attention. The boy was now really interested and asked his dad how that turned out for him. Well, the father explained that once he decided to go down that road, he started seeing wonderful things about his old car again. Those guys that bought new vehicle every couple of years became very poor as they could not keep up with the image of this beautiful vehicle they were driving. The maintenance cost and finance cost of those vehicles were just so much more expensive than the car the farmer was used to drive. Many of them lost their vehicles when they could not afford to drive them anymore. Now the old farmer has got a grin on his face. My old car is now a classic. And because I've looked so well after it all the years, it has gone up significantly in value. I am spending so much time with it now. It's my pride and joy. He continues that the old car only gets to sleep in the garage now. It gets cleaned daily and polished every weekend. He takes the car to shows, and she has won many prizes. Even the young men would still like to have a look under the hood. But it's a no-touch vehicle today. In the meantime, the boy's mother came walking towards them with a cup of coffee for each of them. Now tell me, what are you two boys talking about? The son replied to his mother that they were talking about cars. The boy then asks, Hey mom, if dad was a car, what type of a car would you say he was? The old lady thought for a moment and then said, I think that if your father was a car, your father would have been a garbage truck. Obviously much larger than what he is supposed to be. Always smelly, but hey, we can't go without it for more than a week. <laughs> In our last funny story of the day, we bring you a tale of a carpenter and a ghostly sound. As promised, we left the best for last. But before we go, we would like to thank you for watching our funny story compilation of the week. If you have enjoyed it, then please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. This way we ensure you get notified about any releases from us. Thank you so much. So here goes with the last joke of the day. In today's funny story, we bring you a story about a haunted closet and a very cornered carpenter. Imagine a very particular housewife, Agatha Huckleberry, being very annoyed with a creaky closet every time a bus goes by. She decided to call in the help of a carpenter to fix this ghostly problem. Agatha Huckleberry clutched a pearl necklace in one hand and a phone in the other. The rhythmic creaking coming from the closet was enough to drive anyone batty. It wasn't a constant groan, mind you. No, this was a symphony of shudders and squeaks that only erupted when a double-decker bus rumbled past their house. Agatha, a woman who prided herself on a well-maintained home and a perfectly curated accent, some might say, couldn't take it anymore. Hello, Bernard's Carpentry. Yes, this is Agatha Huckleberry. I seem to be having a rather peculiar situation. Every time a dreadful double-decker bus rattles past the house, my closet door sounds like it's auditioning for a haunted house tour. Oh no, dears, it's quite sturdy. Mahogany, you see. But the noise, it simply won't do. Could you possibly send someone over? Bernard's Carpentry, known for their motto, We Fix Anything, even if it's possessed by a polka-dotted ghost, a marketing ploy that surprisingly worked, dispatched their finest, Harold, a man with a perpetually worried expression and a toolbox that seemed to hold the solutions to life's most bizarre problems. Mrs. Huckleberry, Harold here from Bernard's Carpentry. Ah, Harold. Do come in. The dreadful noise originates from the linen closet right there. Harold peered into the closet. It was a typical linen closet, shelves crammed with neatly folded towels and Agatha's extensive collection of doilies, some crocheted by hand, some suspiciously store-bought. He tapped the walls, prodded the shelves, even sniffed the doilies, a habit he was trying to break. Nothing. Hmm, seems sturdy enough. Can't say I see anything out of the ordinary, ma'am. But surely you heard the racket just then? 
Here, wait for the next double-decker. They come every ten minutes, like clockwork, the dreadful things. As if on cue, the rumble of a bus engine filled the air. Agatha and Harold stood expectantly. Suddenly, a loud creak reverberated from the closet, followed by a clatter of falling doilies. Harold jumped a foot in the air. See? Did you hear that? Harold gaped at the closet door. This was one for the, we fix anything, even if it's possessed by a polka-dotted ghost hall of fame. Well, this is a puzzler. Perhaps if I... Goodness, no, you can't possibly climb in there. Ma'am, I've dealt with rogue rocking chairs, possessed rocking horses. Those things are terrifying. Even a haunted grandfather clock that insisted on playing disco at 3 a.m. in the morning. A noisy closet door won't phase me. Now, if you'll excuse me. Harold crawls into the closet, Agatha looking on with a mixture of disapproval and morbid curiosity. Inside the closet, Harold contorted himself into a pretzel, dodging doilies and trying to get a good look at the creaky culprit. Minutes ticked by. Agatha fidgeted and then went into the bathroom. At exactly that time, Agatha's husband Bartholomew arrived home from work earlier than usual. He called out to Agatha as he enters the house. Agatha, my dear, I'm home. Bartholomew, not getting any response from Agatha, walked upstairs, wanting to get a warm jacket, as is his usual routine, from the ghostly closet. In the meantime, Agatha, knowing about the carpenter in the closet, rushed half-dressed out of the bathroom to warn Bartholomew about the imminent danger of a carpenter in the closet. But before she can reach him to explain, he opens the closet door and got a surprise of his life to find a strange man hiding in his closet. At this exact moment, Agatha, half-dressed, enters the bedroom with a very surprised look on her face. As Agatha desperately started to explain, Bartholomew interrupts her abruptly, turning to the man in the closet. He then asks, And what exactly are you doing in my closet? The carpenter, understanding the awkwardness of this scene, of a man in the closet, a half-naked wife, and a very surprised husband. He clearly understands the predicament, and he decided to go for the million-dollar answer. You will never believe me, sir. But I am waiting for the bus. <laughs> Our first joke of the day is a funny story about war, like it's never been told before. All right, folks, buckle up. Today's joke takes us to the most epic war story ever. Or at least it would be epic if I knew any actual history. But fear not, because I have a special brand of historical knowledge. Think Wikipedia after a few too many rum punches. Wink, wink. Let's see if we can unearth a funny nugget from the dusty battlefield of my brain. The Global Cafeteria Brawl. A look at World War II. Imagine the world as a giant high school cafeteria, buzzing with students from all corners of the globe. In one corner sits Germany, the resident bully, fueled by a desire for more territory and a grudge against the victors of the previous cafeteria brawl, World War I. They start snatching lunch money, resources, from weaker countries like Austria and Czechoslovakia. France and Britain, the cafeteria monitors, see this and worry. They don't want to fight, but they also can't let Germany keep pushing everyone around. When Germany grabs all of Poland's lunch, invades Poland, it's the last straw. France and Britain declare war, essentially starting a cafeteria brawl. Across the table sits Italy, Germany's best friend, ally. They're not the strongest fighters, but they love to brag and join the fight to impress everyone. Japan, another bully on the other side of the cafeteria, sees this as their chance. They launch a surprise attack on America's best friend, Hawaii's lunch line, bombing Pearl Harbor. Furious, America joins the fight, turning the cafeteria into a chaotic food fight. Tanks become makeshift battering rams, airplanes rain down mashed potatoes, bombs, and soldiers fling sporks, grenades, at each other. It's a total mess. The fight goes global. The cafeteria brawl quickly spills outside. Germany attacks the Soviet Union, 
hoping for a quick victory. But the Soviets fight back fiercely, like a lunch lady defending her precious cafeteria supplies. Meanwhile, Japan tears through Southeast Asia, conquering territories like they're stealing lunch trays. The tide turns. The fight drags on for years, leaving everyone exhausted and hungry, resource depleted. The good guys, the allies, including the US, Britain, the Soviet Union, and China, band together. They outsmart and overpower the bad guys, the Axis, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Detention for everyone. The Allies win, but at a terrible cost. Millions are dead, cities are in ruins, and the cafeteria is a wreck. Germany, Italy, and Japan get the ultimate detention. They're occupied by the Allies and forced to rebuild what they destroyed. Lessons learned. World War II was a harsh reminder of the dangers of unchecked aggression and nationalism. After the dust settled, the cafeteria monitors, victorious allies, created a new system, the United Nations, to try and prevent such a massive brawl from ever happening again. This is just a simplified snapshot of a complex event. There are many important details and figures left out, but hopefully it piques your interest and gives you a starting point to learn more about this pivotal moment in history. History buffs might scoff at the spork throwing and dodgeball references, but this lighthearted approach highlights the underlying reasons why tensions flared. Germany, resentful of the harsh treatment it received after the previous cafeteria brawl, World War I, felt they deserved more power and territory. This insatiable hunger for dominance, coupled with charismatic but ruthless leaders like Hitler, set the stage for a new conflict. Just like when the cafeteria bully snatches someone's lunch money, Germany's aggressive land grabs couldn't be ignored by the established powers. This, in turn, led to the cafeteria monitors, France and Britain, stepping in. All right, all right, enough with the history lesson. Let's fast forward through this slower than molasses in January intro and get to the funny part already. Long after the fireworks of World War II had fizzled out, a little old man with a face redder than a borscht beet shuffled into the priest's office. Guilt gnawed at him worse than his dentures. The priest, a wise old soul with a twinkle in his eye, ushered him in. Fop. The old man confessed. Back when the whole Nazi business was going down, a young farmhand with legs that went on for miles came knocking on my door one night. Scared out of her overalls, poor thing. So, being the good Samaritan I am, I hit her. In the hayloft, of course. Kept her safe and sound from those pesky Messerschmitts. The priest chuckled. Ah, that's a noble deed, my son. No need to feel any guilt for helping someone out in a pinch. But father... The old man mumbled, shifting uncomfortably. It seems she got a mite grateful. Started showing her appreciation in ways that, well, let's just say she showed her gratefulness in physical pleasure. Happened a few times a day, and even twice on Sundays. Bless her heart. The priest raised an eyebrow. Well, those were stressful times, son. Two young people cooped up together, scared of those pesky bombs. Completely understandable. No need to dwell on it. Relief washed over the old man's face. Thank you, Father. You've lifted a huge weight off my shoulders. Just one little thing, though. Yes, my son. The old man leaned in conspiratorially. Should I tell her that the war ended 20 years ago? In our next funny story, we bring you a captain of a ship fighting of some pirates. Let's find out just how brave he really is. Ahoy there, mateys. Gather round and listen closely, for I be about to tell you a story joke that be more twisty-turny than a pretzel dipped in butter. The hilarious history of pirates. Imagine this. It's the 1600s. Europe's all a Twitter cause Christopher Columbus just stumbled upon this whole new world chock full of shiny gold and enough sugar to make your teeth sing sea shanties. Now naturally, everyone wants a piece of that treasure pie. But here's the thing. Getting your hands on that gold was no walk in the park. 
you had to sail these rickety wooden ships across vast oceans, filled with more scurvy-ridden sailors than you could shake a parrot at. That's where our pirate pals come in, like the original delivery dudes of danger. These weren't your mama's pirates, though. They were a motley crew of scoundrels, scalawags, and folks who just couldn't hold a steady job on land. We're talking peg-legged fellas with parrots on their shoulders, swashbuckling ladies who could sword fight in heels and probably win, and even a blind pirate named Black Bart Roberts who terrorized the seas with nothing but a good sense of smell and a mean sense of direction. Now, these pirates weren't exactly what you'd call lawful good. They were more like chaotic neutral, partiers with a plundering problem. Their motto? Why work for gold when you can steal it from someone who has way too much? Here's how it worked. A pirate ship, looking all spiffy with its red sails, because who needs camouflage when you're this terrifying, would spot a nice plump merchant vessel loaded with doubloons and spices. They'd raise their Jolly Roger flag, which basically said, hey, we're here to steal your stuff and maybe sing some sea shanties later. The merchant ship, being a bit of a scaredy cat, would try to outrun the pirates. Cue the epic chase scene. Cannons would roar, parrots would squawk, because apparently even birds like a good fight. And the pirates would swing from ropes like a drunken jungle gym competition. Now, if the pirates caught up, things could get a bit messy. There'd be sword fights that would make fencing look like patty cake and enough yelling to make a sailor blush. And sailors blush a lot, let me tell you. But hey, at least they had rum to drown their sorrows or celebrate their victories. Pirates were equal opportunity partiers. But here's the kicker. Being a pirate wasn't all sunshine and stolen loot. Their lives were brutal. They faced storms that could crack a kraken's beak, diseases that spread faster than rumors on a pirate ship, which is saying something, and constant threats from the navies who weren't exactly fans of their whole stealing everything that isn't nailed down business model. So why did they do it? Well, some did it for the adventure, some for the rum, and some because, frankly, the open seas and the chance to be your own boss seemed a lot more appealing than spending your days swabbing the decks on a stuffy navy ship. You see, pirates weren't just interested in gold. They also carted around all sorts of exotic goods, spices, fabrics, even new types of vegetables. They were like the Uber Eats of the 17th century, except instead of hangry customers, they had cutlass-wielding pirates. By traipsing all over the globe and trading their loot, pirates unknowingly spread cultures and helped connect different parts of the world. So, next time you bite into a spicy curry or wear a silk shirt, you can thank a pirate for introducing it to the world, even if they got it by somewhat unconventional means. All right. That'd be enough history for one day. But before we set sail on the high seas of hilarity with our pirate joke, let me ask you this. If pirates were the original delivery dudes, what kind of special requests do you think they'd get? Stay tuned to find out, mateys. There be laughs ahoy. Avast, ye landlubbers. Gather round and listen to a tale of swashbuckling bravery and a captain who was, well, let's just say, fashionably challenged. We're sailing the high seas in the golden age of piracy, where danger lurked around every reef and treasure chests overflowed with enough gold to make a dragon drool. Our story follows Captain Pegleg Pete, a fearsome fellow with a beard that could house a family of barnacles and a battle cry that could curdle milk at 50 paces. Now, Pete wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, but what he lacked in brains he made up for in well, something. Let's just say his strategic brilliance wasn't exactly legendary. One fine day, Pete's ship, the Rusty Nail, was cruising along when a lookout screeched, Captain, pirate ship on starboard side. Panic rippled through the crew faster than a stowaway with a yen for grog. But Pete, cool as a cucumber dipped in rum, boomed. Fear not me, hearties. Bring me my red shirt. The first mate, a scrawny fella named Nigel with a nervous twitch, scurried below deck and returned with a bright red shirt that could be seen from Neptune's bathtub. 
Pete donned the shirt with the swagger of a peacock and roared. To battle. The fight was fierce. Cannons boomed, cutlasses clashed, and parrots squawked encouragement. Or maybe insults. It's hard to tell with those feathery fiends. But Pete, his red shirt a beacon of courage, or maybe a giant target depending on who you asked, led his crew to a glorious victory. Though there were some bumps and bruises, the rusty nail emerged victorious. Later that day, another pirate ship hove into view, this one twice the size of the first. The crew, still shaken from the previous battle, looked to Pete with wide eyes. But Pete, ever the picture of composure, bellowed. Same drill, lads, bring me my red shirt. The battle raged anew, even fiercer than before. Cannons roared louder, cutlasses clashed angrier, and parrots, well, you get the idea. But once again, Pete, his red shirt a symbol of unwavering leadership, or maybe just a giant shoot here sign, led his crew to victory. This time though, the victory came at a heavier cost, with several injuries and a singed beard for poor Pete. Exhausted but triumphant, the crew gathered on deck that night, nursing wounds and sharing grog. One young deckhand, a wide-eyed lad named Barnaby, finally piped up, Captain, sir, why the red shirt before battle? Pete, sporting a bandage that looked suspiciously like a parrot had taken a liking to his ear, puffed out his chest and declared, In the heat of battle, a red shirt hides the blood, lad. That way, the crew fights on without fear. The crew, touched by Pete's apparent selflessness, murmured their admiration. Barnaby, however, still looked a tad confused. As dawn painted the sky a fiery red, the lookout shrieked. Captain, ten pirate ships on the horizon, all with boarding parties. The crew froze, fear etched on their faces. Pete, however, remained unfazed. He took a deep breath, then, All right, lads. He boomed, a hint of panic creeping into his voice. This time, bring me my brown pants. In the following funny story, we bring you a magician who is continually outwitted by a parrot until he had enough. In today's story joke, a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat at a party. The impressed host asks, how'd you do that? The magician shrugs and says, honestly, I have no idea. I was just trying to find my car keys. Ready to ditch the smoke and mirrors? All right. Now that we've gotten that awkward silence out of the way, buckle up, because we're about to take a whirlwind tour through the wacky, wonderful, and sometimes downright weird history of magic. Ever wondered why rabbits appear out of hats? Spoiler alert, rabbits hate hats. It all started way back in the prehistoric era, when our grug-wearing ancestors discovered the magic of, well, hitting things with sticks. Oof! grunted Grog the nearly wise. That rock moved after I whacked it with this pointy stick. Must be magic. And thus, the illustrious career of the magician formerly known as Caveman was launched. Unfortunately, his act got a little stale after, you know, the millionth time. The audience retention for stick-based magic wasn't great. Fast forward a few millennia and enter the Egyptians. Now these guys were onto something. Hieroglyphics, magical, pyramids, super magical. Mummification, that's a little out of my expertise, but definitely a conversation starter at parties. Egyptian magicians, decked out in more gold than a discount jewelry store, were the rock stars of their day. They performed everything from healing tricks, though sadly, no mummy resurrection packages, to convincing Pharaoh he wasn't balding. Spoiler alert, he was. Then came the Greeks and Romans. These folks were all about logic and philosophy, but even they couldn't resist a good magic show. Their magicians, the Magi, pronounced magicians who totally stole our act, according to the disgruntled Egyptians, were all about the theatrics. Think flashy costumes, dramatic pronouncements, and disappearing acts, 
although some suspect that was just them ducking out for a toga 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 party. One famous Roman magician, the amazing Fabian, claimed he could turn water into wine. The crowd loved it, until they realized he'd just snuck out back and swapped the cups. Whoops. Moving on to the Middle Ages, things got a bit dark. Magic became synonymous with witchcraft, cauldrons full of dubious eye of newt stew, and pointy hats, which again, the hats lobbied heavily against. This was a rough time for magicians. Being accused of witchcraft could land you a one-way ticket to a fiery demise. It turns out defying physics is a lot less impressive when the stakes are that high. Thankfully, the Renaissance brought a brighter outlook. Science started to take center stage, but there was still a place for a little hocus-pocus. Enter the alchemist. These folks were obsessed with turning lead into gold, which, let's be honest, sounds like a way better use of your time than arguing with a grumpy hat. Sadly, their methods were about as successful as convincing a mime to talk. Lots of explosions, zero gold. But hey, at least they invented some cool stuff along the way, like accidentally creating the recipe for Tang. By the 19th century, magic had shed its dark reputation and was back in the spotlight. The Victorians, with their love of all things mysterious, went wild for stage magicians. These guys were the ultimate showmen, pulling rabbits out of hats, much to the rabbits' continued dismay. Sawing ladies in half, don't worry, they always came back together, and making elephants disappear, although that one usually involved a strategically placed curtain and a very confused elephant. Well, let me tell you a story about a magician named Magic Monty. So, that brings us almost to the present day. Magic has come a long way, from prehistoric bonks with sticks to disappearing acts that would make even Houdini jealous. But some classic tricks remain a mystery. Like, why the persistent popularity of, well, let's just say a certain furry friend and a very specific type of headwear? This enduring question deserves a closer look. Now, lights, camera, magic, mischief. The SS Abracadabra rumbled on the high seas its passengers a rollicking mix of sunburnt tourists and bingo enthusiasts. But tonight, all eyes were on Montgomery Monty Magic, a once-renowned magician whose career had hit rockier waters than the current storm. Monty wasn't having a good night. Every flourish of his cape was met with stony silence, every dazzling display of sleight of hand drowned out by a squawk. Perched on a grumpy-looking man's shoulder, a parrot with a voice like a rusty hinge was Monty's nemesis. It's up his sleeve. The parrot would screech, shattering the illusion of Monty's disappearing handkerchief. Simple misdirection. Did it mock after Monty's mind-reading trick? The audience, initially bewildered, found themselves erupting in laughter. Not at Monty's magic, but at the bird's scathing commentary. Monty's smile began to resemble a cracked eggshell. With a bead of sweat trickling down his forehead, he attempted his grand finale, predicting a chosen card. But before he could reveal his triumphant flourish, the parrot squawked. He led the audience to the answer with leading questions. A primal roar erupted within Monty. This wasn't entertainment anymore. It was torture by a feathered critic. In a moment of blind fury, Monty stormed off stage, muttering about revenge and an oddly specific craving for dynamite. That night, Monty lit the fuse to the dynamite. The next morning, the SS Abracadabra resembled a shipwrecked piñata. Splintered wood bobbed amongst the churning waves, the only survivors clinging to a lone door. Monty, with a singed beard and a sheepish look, and the parrot, inexplicably dry. An awkward silence stretched between them, punctuated only by the rhythmic lapping of the waves. Finally, the parrot cocked its head and squawked. All right, I give up. Where's the ship? <laughs> In our next funny story, we delve into the brain and the age-old phenomena of forgetfulness. In today's funny story joke, we're scratching our heads harder than a dog trying to understand a magic trick. It's all about the wonderful, mysterious, and sometimes frustrating human brain. 
will be joining Aunt Mildred and Uncle Melvin, a couple whose memories are about as reliable as a used flip phone. Get ready for some serious brain fumbles, but before we witness this comedic cognitive catastrophe, let's delve into the wacky world of aging brains. Buckle up, because things are about to get a little nutty. Our brains, like our favorite pair of jeans, experience some wear and tear as we age. Here's the science behind those memory lapses, delivered with a humorous twist. Imagine your brain as a bustling city. Information travels on highways, nerve fibers, between buildings, brain cells, using little mail carriers, neurotransmitters. These mail carriers deliver messages that make us remember our grocery list, hopefully, solve a crossword puzzle, maybe not, or even remember where we parked the car, unlikely. Now picture this city going through some renovations. With age, the highways, nerve fibers, get a little congested. The fatty insulation around them, myelin sheath, can deteriorate, slowing down message delivery. This is like rush hour traffic permanently messing with your mail service. Fewer mail carriers, neurotransmitters, are on the job. Our brains produce less of these chemical messengers, making it harder for messages to get from point A to point B. Imagine a postal worker shortage leading to a backlog of undelivered mail, memories. Some buildings, brain cells, might have fewer connections. The number of connections between brain cells, synapses, can decrease. This is like having fewer roads connecting different parts of your city, making it harder to get around and find things. Here's the funny part. You might start relying on the scenic route. With slower message delivery, your brain might take longer, more roundabout paths to find information. This explains why it takes forever to remember your neighbor's name, but you can still recall every embarrassing moment from high school with crystal clarity. Thanks, brain. The to-do list gets lost in the mail. You might forget simple things because the message never reaches its destination. This is why writing things down becomes crucial, just like sticking a giant reminder note on your front door. Think of a young brain as a brand new, efficient city. Everything runs smoothly, information travels quickly, and you can remember everything from your dentist appointment to the lyrics of that catchy song you heard once. An older brain is like that same city after years of wear and tear. It still functions, but things might take a little longer and some deliveries might get lost along the way. The good news? Just like you can improve traffic flow in a city by adding new roads or optimizing routes, we can keep our brains sharp with mental exercises, staying socially active and even getting enough sleep. So, embrace the occasional memory lapse, laugh it off, and keep your brain city thriving. All right, folks, enough with the brain dissertations. Time to ditch the textbooks and dive headfirst into the hilarious world of senior forgetfulness. Today's joke stars Aunt Mildred and Uncle Melvin, a couple whose memories are about as sharp as a butter knife used to cut a brick. Buckle up, because we're about to witness a comedic cognitive catastrophe of epic proportions. Get ready to LOL so hard, you might just forget where you put your teeth. Don't worry, Aunt Mildred probably forgot too. An uncle and aunt, both pushing 90, were getting forgetful. They shuffled into the doctor's office, worried their memories were fading faster than their eyesight. The doctor gave them a clean bill of health, except for the usual aches and pains that came with eight decades on the planet. But it's not unusual to be forgetful at your age. Why not write things down you might forget? Later that night, the flickering light from the TV cast dancing shadows on the wall as Mildred knitted furiously. Suddenly, Melvin, her husband, lumbered to his feet with a gasp, like a man possessed. Aha! The craving strikes again! He boomed, his voice echoing in the quiet living room. Fear not, my sweet Mildred, for I, your valiant knight, shall venture forth into the perilous kitchen and vanquish the ice cream dragon. Will you bring me some ice cream with, dear? Yes, of course, darling. Maybe you should write it down. You know what the doctor said. What if you forget? No, I will remember. You want some ice cream? 
but I want chocolate sauce on the ice cream. Maybe you should really write is down. I will remember that my wife. You want chocolate sauce on your ice cream. But I want some of those small nuts on it as well. But you must write it down. You will forget. Yes, of course, darling. The uncle lumbered back into the living room, sweat beating on his forehead, a triumphant grin plastered on his face. He proudly presented Auntie with a plate, holding two perfectly fried eggs and a side of crispy bacon. Behold! He declared, his voice hoarse from exertion. He, after a harrowing journey through the treacherous fridge and a fierce battle with the stubborn spatula, I present breakfast. Auntie Mildred looked at the plate and said, And this is why I told you to write it down. Where is my toast? <laughs> like we promised, the best funny story is for last. Before we get going, we like to thank you for being with us. Please also have a look at our previous week's best funny stories. Okay, folks, here goes. Forget Mars versus Venus. It's more like socks versus laundry baskets. In today's cartoon story joke, The Age-Old Battle of the Sexes, scientists have debated for years. How different are men's and women's brains, really? Today, we're not just cracking open skulls, metaphorically, of course. We're going full-on Indiana Jones, venturing deep into the uncharted territory of male versus female thought patterns. Buckle up, folks, because we're about to witness the discovery of a mental artifact so powerful, so earth-shattering, it'll make you question everything you thought you knew about Laundry Day. Back in the day, science types thought the only difference between men's and women's brains came from life experiences. You know, like wives reminding their husbands to breathe occasionally, Insert dramatic fainting couch emoji here. But one guy, Nirao Shah, wasn't buying it. He was on a mission to find the real reason behind why some folks are champion shoppers and others get lost asking for directions. Hint, it's usually not the shoppers. So, he dug into genes and how they might influence these behaviors differently in men and women. This wasn't exactly a crowd pleaser at the Brain Research Society. It was like suggesting squirrels built the pyramids, except way less impressive. But Shaw was persistent, and guess what? Turns out, there might be some truth to that whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus thing after all. Fast forward to today, and science has a mountain of evidence. We've peeked inside brains, and let me tell you, they're not all wired the same way. Men's brains seem more into bro time activities like navigating with a map, hopefully, and picturing complex shapes like the perfect parking spot. Women's brains, on the other hand, excel at remembering details using language and maybe even multitasking, like remembering where they parked while chatting on the phone, for example. But hey, this isn't a competition. Think of them as specialized tools a hammer is great for building a deck, but you wouldn't use it for brain surgery, unless you're a very determined zombie. The kicker? These brain differences start early, way before pink versus blue toys even enter the picture. Even babies show preferences for certain activities. It's like nature is pre-programming us. But why the difference? Enter the hormone stage. During development, a testosterone surge in males shapes their brains differently than the estrogen symphony in females. It's like a cosmic jukebox playing different tunes for each sex. These hormonal differences might even explain why some disorders affect men and women differently, like why women are more prone to depression and anxiety, while men are more susceptible to alcoholism and autism. The science is still unfolding, but one thing's clear, our brains aren't one size fits all. Understanding these differences can help us appreciate our strengths, weaknesses, and maybe even explain why men never seem to understand those subtle hints women drop, like needing a new car. Just saying. Now, onto the real reason we're here. A couple of guys were in the dressing room, 
practically horizontal after a brutal golf game. A mobile phone starts to ring, and one of the guys answers it while putting it on speaker while he continues to get dressed. A woman over the speaker for everyone to hear said, Hi, honey. I am in town, and I found these wonderful pair of leather boots. You know those ones which I always wanted. How much? The guy asks for everyone to hear. The wife said, Well, it's a bit expensive. It's $500. Honey, you deserve it. Get it. And put it on the credit card. The man said. Then to the envy of all the guys, the wife said, Oh, and on my way here, I passed the Mercedes dealership, and they have one of those cabriolet sports cars, which you know we spoke about before. And it's in that color you like. You know they don't stick around for long on the showroom floor. Go buy it and make sure he gives you a good price on your vehicle. Negotiate hard, but get it. The guy said. To all the guy's amusement, as they are now filled with envy, the wife continued. Oh, and on the way here, the agent phoned for that holiday home we made an offer on. The sellers have dropped their asking price. Yes, I heard the couple was getting a divorce. Tell him we will take it and transfer the deposit. The guy said. The wife on the other end of the phone was very happy and said, Okay, I will do all of it right away, and then we can have a wonderful time tonight. Cheers. The man took the phone from speaker, hung up, and continued to get dressed. All the men in the dressing room were filled with envy. As he was ready to leave the dressing room, the guy asked all the guys in the dressing room, Do any of you guys know who the idiot is that forgot his mobile phone here in the dressing room? <laughs> in our first funny story of the week, we bring you a tale about a donkey, or a jackass as they are called. Ever wondered how to handle unsolicited advice from the back of a donkey? Hang on to your reins because in today's funny story joke, Orville Ornery O'Sullivan and his witty sidekick, Beatrice, take you on a journey where critics meet comedy in the most unexpected ways. Orville Ornery O'Sullivan shuffled down the dusty road, his weathered face creased with a scowl that could curdle milk. Beside him clopped a scrawny donkey named Beatrice, her ears permanently pricked in a state of perpetual suspicion. Perched precariously on Beatrice's bony back was Orville's eight-year-old grandson, Timmy, bouncing like a particularly enthusiastic beanbag chair. Grandpa. Timmy piped up, his voice high-pitched and cheerful. Don't you think it's kind of weird for me to be riding and you to be walking? You look like a grasshopper with a sprained ankle. Orville grunted. It's the only way your scrawny shins won't rub blisters the size of dinner plates on Beatrice's bony hide, you little rapscallion. Just then, a shiny carriage pulled by two well-fed horses approached, kicking up a dust cloud that momentarily obscured the road. Inside, a portly woman with a feather boa the size of a boa constrictor squinted at them. For shame! She huffed, her voice dripping with faux concern. The poor old man trudging along while the child sits pretty. What a disgrace. Orville choked back a retort about her carriage's resemblance to a gilded outhouse and mumbled something about fresh air being good for the soul. Timmy, however, wasn't one for subtlety. Hey, lady. He yelled, waving a fist. It's my grandpa and my donkey, and we can ride or walk however we darn well please. The carriage sped on leaving behind a cloud of dust and Orville with a throbbing vein in his forehead. Grumbling under his breath about uppity city folk, he helped Timmy swap places. They continued, Timmy waddling uncomfortably beside Beatrice while Orville enjoyed the surprisingly comfortable donkey ride. He hadn't realized how much his knees ached until that moment, but their newfound peace was shattered by a group of rowdy cowboys approaching. The leader, a man with a handlebar mustache that would make a walrus jealous eyed them with amusement. Well, howdy there, partner. You sure got a mighty fine-looking donkey there. You wouldn't happen to be mistreating that poor little fellow, would you? He gestured to Timmy, who scowled back with all the fierceness an eight-year-old could muster. He ain't mistreating nobody. Timmy protested. 
I just gotta walk because he gets back pains if we both ride. The cowboys burst into laughter, hoots echoing across the prairie. Orville, feeling his cheeks burn with embarrassment, decided to take action. All right, all right, that's enough. He barked, dismounting Beatrice. Timmy, hop on. They continued, both perched atop the now slightly disgruntled donkey. It wasn't the most comfortable ride, Beatrice's bony spine digging into their nether regions with alarming regularity. But at least they weren't being judged, right? Wrong. As they traversed a bustling market town, a group of elderly women gathered outside a bakery, their eyes sharp as tacks under their frilly hats. Oh, the cruelty. Gasped one, her voice tight with manufactured outrage. Two grown men piling on top of that poor creature. It's a disgrace. Chimed in another, clutching a loaf of bread like a weapon. Don't they have any shame? Orville, at his wit's end, threw his hands up in the air. Look, ladies. He bellowed. We tried walking. We tried one at a time, but nothing seems to please you. What do you want us to do? A thoughtful silence descended upon the group. Finally, the first woman spoke. Well, you could always just carry the donkey. She said with a sly smile. Before Orville could respond with a string of expletives that would make a sailor blush, Timmy piped up, a mischievous glint in his eye. That's a great idea. Come on, Grandpa, let's give it a shot. And so, Orville found himself with Beatrice draped limply over his shoulder, her hooves dangling precariously close to his head. Timmy, perched precariously on Beatrice's belly, giggled with glee. The townsfolk stared, then burst into laughter. Just as Orville was about to unleash the full fury of his vocabulary, they reached the bridge. The rickety wooden structure groaned under their combined weight, and with a yelp that would make a coyote proud, Orville stumbled. Beatrice, sensing freedom, bolted, dragging Orville with her. They crashed into the railing, sending Beatrice tumbling over the edge and into the murky water below and drowned. A splash. Silence. The moral of the story? If you try to please everyone, you might as well kiss your ass goodbye. Our second funny story of the day is a classic story of Red Riding Hood, like it's never been told before. In today's funny story, we bring an epic story like it's never been told before. You might have heard many funny stories about Little Red Riding Hood, but this one has never been told before. As Farmer Jack will be the first to tell this funny story, we want you to sit back and enjoy the ride or enjoy the walk for that matter. So, Little Red Riding Hood was walking through the forest with her little basket. She was very happy and was singing as far as she went. However, as she went deeper and deeper into the forest, the forest became darker and she started to hear funny noises. She was clearly concerned for her safety, as she had been told before, about the big bad wolf lurking in the forest. However, she kept singing the same old song. She spotted a movement and could see that something was hiding behind a tree. She stopped and asked, Is that you, Mr. Big Bad Wolf, hiding behind that tree? The wolf came out of his hiding and with a sleeky look on his face said, Yes, it's me, Little Red Riding Hood, and where might you be heading? I bet you are on your way to your old granny, living all alone in the forest, aren't you? Now the big bad wolf has been planning to go and eat old granny for some time, but was waiting for Little Red Riding Hood to visit granny. He could then have two meals for the effort of one. He, however, was very surprised to learn that Little Red Riding Hood was not on her way to granny. So where are you going then? Asks the wolf. Little Red Riding Hood said, I am on my way to visit my cousin Mary, and she is not afraid of any big bad wolves. And where were you going? Asks Little Red Riding Hood. The big bad wolf, still very confused, as he knows these woods so well and had heard about cousin Mary, but had never visited her area before, lied and spoke. No Little Red Riding Hood, you will be safe going to your cousin. 
because I am going to visit the three little piggies. The wolf then left. As Little Red Riding Hood walks further through the forest, singing her same old song, the wolf followed her. He was thinking that if he can trap Little Red Riding Hood and her cousin Mary together, then he can still have two meals for the effort of one. Close to her cousin Mary's house, Little Red Riding Hood again hears something in the forest behind a tree, and again, she stops to ask. Is that you, Mr. Big Bad Wolf, hiding behind that tree? The wolf again appeared and spoke. Yes, it's me, Little Red Riding Hood. Seems like the three little piggies stay close to your cousin Mary. But I promise you, you will arrive safely at your cousin Mary, as I am going to visit the three little piggies. Little Red Riding Hood then continued the road to her cousin Mary, singing the same old song. Once she arrived at her cousin Mary's house, she was amazed by how beautiful the place was. The house was on a cliff, and the scenery was magic. They were still busy packing Little Red Riding Hood's basket out, when suddenly, the big bad wolf appeared. He was growling, and it was clear to the two of them that this wolf meant business. The wolf charged, and Little Red Riding Hood and her cousin Mary ran the only way they could. The big bad wolf now had them cornered, and they were standing on the edge of the cliff. They had no way to go. Now, said the big bad wolf, you can jump over the cliff and fall yourself to death, and I will eat you, or you can come into the house with me, and I will still eat you. The big bad wolf was now very brave. Unfortunately, he forgot some minor details. The next moment, the big bad wolf got a heavy thump in his back, and he flew over the cliff. On his way down to his death, he was thinking, What on dear earth have just happened? Then it struck him. The same old song that Little Red Riding Hood was singing while walking through the forest was the answer. He started crying as he sang the song. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little... Our next funny story bring you a bride-to-be that have a big problem to solve in order to have her day to be perfect. It's a story of jealousy. Buckle up, folks, because this is a wedding story wilder than a runaway bouquet toss. With a jealousy between two women more loaded than a high school science project gone terribly wrong. So, picture this. Jennifer, positively glowing with pre-wedding bliss. Her dress is perfect, the venue's booked, and even the caterer hasn't messed up the canapes, yet. The only cloud on this sunshine-filled horizon? Her parents' recent very public divorce. Think, Geraldo Rivera throws a microphone at a restraining order, but Jennifer, bless her optimistic soul, is determined to have a picture-perfect wedding. Now, some scientists say jealousy is more common in men, fueled by some primal urge to protect their mates. Others say it's a woman thing, driven by a need for emotional security. But let me tell you, in the case of Jennifer's wedding, this jealousy was a double threat, a two-woman tango of teal and trouble. You see, science tells us that jealousy is like a funky smoke detector in our brains. It goes off when it perceives a threat, like someone trying to steal your parking spot, your favorite pen, or in this case, the spotlight at your daughter's wedding. Enter her mom, a woman who could turn a trip to the grocery store into a fashion show. She finds this dress, a vision of emerald green that practically screams most stylish mother of the bride ever. Jennifer does a happy dance, relieved that at least one wedding detail won't be a disaster. Fast forward a week, Jennifer's scrolling through Instagram when a picture stops her cold. It's her dad, beaming next to a woman who looks like Barbie after a Botox bender. And what's Barbie wearing? The exact same emerald dress. Turns out, Dad's new, much younger wife, Bethany, has the same exquisite taste in gowns and questionable life choices as Jennifer's mom. Panic sets in. Jennifer calls Bethany, begging her to choose another dress. Honey. Bethany purrs in a voice smoother than butter on a hot day. 
This dress makes me look like a million bucks. And let's be honest, it's not like your mom invented green, is it? Jennifer wants to scream, but settles for a face plant into a very unweddingy pillow. Jennifer relays the disaster to her mom, bracing for fireworks. But to her surprise, her mom just smiles serenely. Don't worry, sweetie, she says, patting Jennifer's hand. I'll find another dress. After all, it's your special day. A wave of relief washes over Jennifer. Mom's a lifesaver. They hit the shops and guess what? They find another stunning dress. This one a sapphire blue that knocks Jennifer's socks off. Crisis averted. Exhausted but triumphant, they celebrate with lunch. Jennifer, feeling peckish and relieved, can't resist asking, So, are you going to return the green dress? You won't have another occasion to wear it, right? Her mom takes a sip of tea, eyes twinkling. Oh, honey. She says with a sly grin. Of course I do. Jennifer leans in, eager to hear about some fancy charity gala her mom has lined up. Her mom leans in closer, voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. I'm wearing it to the wedding rehearsal dinner. In our second last funny story, we bring you Cinderella at the age of 75, getting a second chance. In today's funny story joke, we find Cinderella rocking a life way past her prime, with wishes wilder than a bachelorette party in Vegas and a cat with more side-eye than a disapproving grandma. Get ready to laugh, because this fairy godmother throws a curveball that'll leave you snorting like a startled pug. Cinderella, at a sprightly 75, wasn't exactly rocking the ball scene anymore. In her rocking chair, that is. Perched on her porch, with her ever-judgmental cat Alan as company, she surveyed the world with the wisdom of a woman who'd seen it all. From pumpkin carriages to snoring princes, let's not forget the snoring, life with the dearly departed prince had been an adventure. Deep down though, a tiny part of her couldn't help but wonder what it would have been like to have a partner who was, well, perfect. Someone who shared her love of cozy evenings and never left the toilet seat up. One fine afternoon, Brighter than a rogue disco ball in a retirement home, the fairy godmother shimmered into existence. Alan, ever the fan of personal space, arched his back like a furry question mark. Cinderella. The fairy godmother boomed, her voice still packing the same theatrical punch. After a life well lived, you deserve a little something extra. Three wishes, to be precise. Cinderella blinked. Three wishes at 75? Now that was a retirement plan she hadn't considered. Well... She began, stroking her chin thoughtfully. Money would be nice. Like, obscenely nice. Poof! Her rocking chair transformed into a solid gold monstrosity. Alan, ever practical, let out a yowl that could rival a fire alarm and bolted to the edge of the porch, his claws digging frantic furrows into the wood. Oh, thank you ever so much. Cinderella squeaked, perched precariously on the now uncomfortably warm gold. No worries, dearie. Onwards to wish number two. What's your heart's deepest desire? The fairy godmother chirped. Cinderella gazed down at her creaky knees and sighed. Youth, I suppose. A touch of the old razzle-dazzle wouldn't hurt. In a flash of sparkles, Cinderella was back to her youthful self. Wrinkles vanished, replaced by a dewy glow that could launch a thousand tabloids. A forgotten flutter stirred in her chest, a long dormant yearning for something beyond bingo nights. Excellent choice. One wish left, don't hold back. The fairy godmother beamed. Cinderella glanced at Alan, who was now sporting the kind of deer-in-headlights expression that only comes with facing a magical makeover. Alan, her loyal companion since kittenhood, had always been there. Through thick and thin, through snoring princes and endless cups of chamomile tea, 
he'd been a constant source of purrs and non-judgmental companionship. Maybe, she thought, the perfect partner wasn't someone flawless, but someone who knew you, flaws and all, and loved you anyway. But the yearning for that what if was still there. Make Alan here, she declared, the words tumbling out before she could stop them. A handsome young man, a real looker. Alan let out a pathetic meow, his fur puffing out in protest. But wishes are wishes, and with a snap of the fairy godmother's diamond-encrusted fingers, Alan transformed. He stood tall, a vision of sculpted perfection, with eyes that could melt glaciers and a smile brighter than a dentist's convention. Birds, overcome by sheer handsomeness, began plummeting from the sky like feathered confetti. There you go, Cinderella. The fairy godmother cackled with delight before vanishing in a puff of glitter that smelled suspiciously like mothballs. For a beat, silence reigned. Then, Alan and a very youthful Cinderella stared at each other, the air thick with unspoken, well, everything. Cinderella, breathless, took in the masterpiece before her, every rom-com cliché embodied in one perfectly sculpted human being. Alan, for his part, looked like he was about to faint, or maybe file a lawsuit. He sauntered over, his every step oozing an aura of misplaced confidence. Cinderella, still frozen on her golden throne, found herself unable to tear her gaze away. Leaning in close, Alan whispered into her ear, his voice a husky purr. You know, Cinderella, he murmured, his breath tickling her newly youthful cheek. I bet you're regretting that whole neutering thing right about now. <laughs> In our last funny story of the day, we bring you a funny story about a guy that pitch at work with a earring. But before we go, we would like to thank you for watching our funny story compilation of the week. If you've enjoyed our video, then please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. This way, you will be notified about any releases from us. Thank you so much. Here we go with our last funny story of the day. In today's funny story joke, we venture into the everyday chaos of Bob's life that is a so-called a nervous breakdown trapped in a human body. Grab your popcorn because we're about to witness a fashion crisis messier than Bob's attempts to match socks on a Monday morning. Trust us, it's an uproarious comedy of errors in his wardrobe. Picture a man so uptight his tie could be a ruler and his stress level rivals a stapler on the fritz. But wait, a glimmer of rebellion shines brighter than the soul-sucking fluorescent lights, an earring on Bob's ear. Bob, a man as rigid as a stapler, sat hunched over his computer in a beige cubicle. The fluorescent lights buzzed, mirroring his constant tension. His crisp white shirt, ironed that morning, wrinkles were blasphemy, stood at attention beneath a tie perfectly aligned. Behind him, the company dress code hung like a judge, highlighted in his red pen. A glint of silver caught Harry's eye, a diamond earring on Bob's ear. This was a fashion rebellion in the heart of conformity. Whoa, Bob, what's with the earring? Harry asks, eyes wide in shock. Bob mumbles. Uh, it's not a big deal, just an accessory. Yes, an accessory. A mischievous glint sparked in Harry's eyes as he scooted closer. Bob, company policy and excessive jewelry. Remember the time Marsha wore that scarf that could be seen from space? You, the company code of conduct maniac, made her believe we practically needed sunglasses indoors. You're braver than I thought. He wheezed, barely containing a laugh. Different. This is uh, a bold whisper of rebellion. Very subtle. Definitely within company regulations, we need to express ourselves, you know. His voice, however, lacked the usual conviction, betraying the panic rising in his chest. 
Harry, a man whose sense of humor usually resided somewhere between a damp sock and a tax audit, did a comedic spit take worthy of a stand-up routine, enjoying his friend so-called seemed to be misery. Papers fluttered around him like startled pigeons as he tried and failed to stifle a laugh that threatened to morph into a full-blown hyena impersonation. Wiping a tear from his eye, he wheezed. Whoa, Bob, what's with the earring? Flustered Bob protests. A pirate look? It's not a pirate look. It's sophisticated. And it hasn't been long. Just a few days. Flashback. The aroma of greasy goodness filled the air as Bob, a man who planned his lunch breaks with the precision of a brain surgeon, indulged in his once-a-month cheat meal. A double cheeseburger with extra everything from his favorite, and only slightly questionable, takeout joint. Leaning over to grab a napkin from the passenger seat, a sound like a tiny anvil hitting the floor shattered the blissful silence. There, nestled amongst stray french fries and questionable burger remnants, lay a single diamond earring glinting accusingly under the dim truck light. Bob stared at it, his mind conjuring images of disapproving glances from his wife and a scathing memo from HR about unidentified foreign objects in company vehicles. Present. The color drained from Bob's face faster than you could say dress code violation. The earring, once a source of mild curiosity for his co-worker, now felt like a ticking time bomb strapped to his earlobe. Bob whispers, Uh, actually, it's been since my wife found it in my truck. In our first joke of the day, we bring you Mr. Fitzwilliams from the Department of Absurd Regulations, visiting a pig farm. Hilarious. Today's funny story is all about Orville, the hog father Thompson, a man with a pig farm so legendary, it attracted the attention of some, shall we say, peculiar government officials from the DR, or better known as the Department of Absurd Regulation. Let's see how Orville handled their scrutiny. Orville, the hog father. Thompson was a man who understood pigs. He wasn't your average farmer, no sir. Orville could talk to those pink powerhouses like they were barnyard philosophers. Now, pigs, as history tells us, are descendants of wild boars, ferocious beasts that roamed the Eurasian continent thousands of years ago. Fearsome fighters they were. But Orville saw their potential beyond tusks and temper tantrums. He saw gourmets, discerning connoisseurs of the finest slop. One sunny afternoon, a crisp government suit named Agent Fitzwilliam from the Department of Absurd Regulations arrived at Orville's farm. Fitzwilliam, looking like a man allergic to fresh air, adjusted his tie and peered at the mud-caked pigs with disdain. Mr. Thompson, we've received reports of unsanctioned dietary practices at your farm. Orville, a man with a sun-baked face and a twinkle in his eye chuckled. Dietary practices, huh? Those hogs just like a little variety in their meals, wouldn't you say, boys? A chorus of enthusiastic snorts echoed his statement. One particularly rotund pig, Wilbur, known for his sophisticated palate, oinked in agreement. Fitzwilliam, however, wasn't convinced. Variety, Mr. Thompson? We have reports of leftover pizza, donut holes, even the occasional expired jar of pickles. Orville scratched his chin. Well, you can't blame a pig for having adventurous taste buds, can you? Fitzwilliam puffed up like a deflated balloon. Mr. Thompson, this is clearly animal cruelty. These creatures need a balanced diet. I'm afraid a $10,000 fine is in order. Orville sighed theatrically. All right, all right. Don't you government folks just love your paperwork? Tell you what, why don't you come back tomorrow and see how I really treat my pigs? Intrigued and slightly terrified, Fitzwilliam returned the next day. This time, he was greeted by a sight that made his monocle pop out. Orville stood in a makeshift gourmet market, surrounded by his pigs. He was holding a can of caviar, a voice that could rival a used car salesman booming from a microphone. All right, folks, listen up. Today's special is Beluga Caviar, 
flown in fresh from the Caspian Sea, packed with protein and omega-3s guaranteed to make your snout sing. The pigs, adorned in tiny chef's hats, squealed and oinked with excitement. Wilbur, ever the food critic, sniffed the caviar with an air of disdain. Fitzwilliam was speechless. Mr. Thompson, caviar, for pigs, this is even worse than the pizza. They'll get indigestion. Fitzwilliam almost fainted. Orville simply chuckled, patting Wilbur's head. Another $10,000 fine for you, Mr. Thompson. Now Fitzwilliam was angry. Mr. Thompson, knowing that he has a huge problem on his hands, we're going to have a difficult night. The next morning, early Mr. Fitzwilliams from the Department of Absurd Regulation was ready for his last and final inspection. Mr. Thompson came out of his house with a grin on his face and escorted Mr. Fitzwilliams to the pig pen. Now show me what food you have given your pigs that is applicable for them. Mr. Thompson called all the pigs together. They looked very happy. Now where is their food? Mr. Fitzwilliams asked. It has all been consumed. I gave my pigs each $30 to go into town to buy their own food. <laughs> now we will bring you a joke about a very lazy husband and his clever wife. In today's uproarious funny story tale of home improvement hijinks, join us as a newlywed couple embarks on their journey into domestic, well, let's just say bliss is a word we'll use loosely. Picture this, a charming little house that could be straight out of a fairy tale, except with a mischievous streak that would make even a Disney villain blush. From leaky pipes with a mind of their own, to cars that choose the most inconvenient moments to throw a tantrum, their escapades will have you chuckling in disbelief. So, prepare yourselves for an extravagant odyssey of household mayhem, where every day is an epic quest for sanity and duct tape becomes the ultimate weapon of choice. This is a story of love, laughter, and a whole lot of, honey, can you fix this? Stay tuned for the punchline that'll leave you roaring with laughter. A newlywed couple moves into their charming new house. One day, the husband comes home from work, tired but happy to see his wife. As he hangs up his coat, his wife says, Honey, you know, in the upstairs bathroom, one of the pipes is leaking. Could you fix it? The husband, looking puzzled, replies, What do I look like? Mr. Plumber! The husband just plopped on the couch, a blissful smile plastered on his face, as if he'd just won the lottery. His wife's plumbing request went whooshing past his ears like a leaky faucet joke in a silent movie. He looked as content as a cat in a sunbeam, utterly oblivious to the impending domestic disaster. A few days go by, and the husband comes home from work again, whistling a happy tune. This time, his wife meets him at the door with a concerned expression, holding a car manual like it was a cryptic ancient scroll. Honey, the car won't start. I think it needs a new battery. Could you change it for me? The husband, even more perplexed, responds, What do I look like? Mr. Mechanic? The husband, impervious to her pleas, simply plopped back on the couch, relaxed as a beach bum, kicking off his shoes like he was setting up for a beachside siesta. He grabbed the remote, turned on a nature documentary, and sank into the cushions with the kind of contentment usually reserved for cats and sunbeams. His wife's chore list might as well have been yesterday's news, lost in the junk mail pile. She might have been reciting the Gettysburg Address for all the attention he paid. He was too busy mentally redecorating. In his mind's eye, the leaky faucet wasn't a problem, but a feature. He imagined it as a mini indoor water fountain, adding a touch of zen to their home. The dripping sound? Pure ambiance, like a high-priced spa. Another few days go by, and it's raining heavily. The wife discovers a leak in the roof. She says, Honey, there's a leak on the roof. Can you fix it, please? The husband, by now used to these requests, replies, What do I look like? Bob Vila? The husband, oblivious as a sloth on a Sunday, slumped back onto the couch, whistling a merry tune. The house could have been auditioning for a demolition derby, but his only concern seemed to be the perfect nap angle. Wife, meanwhile, was already strategizing. 
this leaky roof, creaky floor, and her husband? Nope, she could handle a whole house falling apart. This man, however, was clearly optional. The next day, the husband comes home to a surprising sight. The roof is fixed, the plumbing is in perfect condition, and the car is purring like a kitten. He asks his wife what happened. Oh, I had a handyman come in and fix them. The woman said casually. Great! How much is that going to cost me? He snarls, bracing himself for a hefty bill. The wife replied, Nothing. He said he'd do it for free if I either baked him a cake or slept with him. Uh, well, what kind of cake did you make? Asked the husband, a hint of worry in his voice. The wife replied, Oh no, honey. What do I look like? A baker? In our next joke, we will bring you a grandfather, wanting to impress his grandchildren and a big mouse mistake. In today's story joke, an unexpected visitor and a perplexed devil set the stage for a wild and hilarious tale. Picture this. The devil, engrossed in the Codex Gigas, the legendary devil's Bible, is stumped by a missing data file. What follows is a chaotic adventure involving giant mice, panicked grandchildren, and a twist you won't see coming. Stay tuned for this hilarity. Believe me, you wouldn't want to miss it. An old man suddenly arrived in a burst of flames, looking confused and lost. The devil, busy flipping through the Codex Gigas, the largest extant medieval illuminated manuscript known as the Devil's Bible, frowned. He was unable to find this old man's data file. This can't be right, the old man grumbled, looking at the devil. I've been a good man my whole life. The devil nodded apologetically. Most people said this when they arrived at hell. Why don't you start with how you died and we'll figure it out, he suggested. The old man sighed and began. Well, I was out with my grandchildren, enjoying a fun day out. I don't get the grandchildren often because my eyesight is starting to fade. But we were having the most wonderful time. Go on, the devil said glancing at the full-page portrait of himself in the Codex Gigas. Legend has it that this manuscript, created in the early 13th century, was completed overnight with the help of the devil himself. But I needed to keep going. You see, with mice, you need to see their guts to know they're dead. Otherwise, they'll be back with others. So you killed it? The devil asked. Some of his demigods had come to listen to the story, curious about the unfolding drama. By golly, I did. Guts and all were splattered for all to see. The kids had lost their minds at this point. Tears everywhere. A crowd had gathered as well, all screaming at the sight. It was at this point, though, that the exertion caught up with me. I felt my heart give way. I must have suffered a heart attack. Next thing I know, I'm here. Well, the devil said, concerned. This doesn't seem to add up. Let me just give heaven a call and we'll try to see what's going on here. The devil pulled a phone from thin air and dialed a number. Hey, St. Peter, bro, the devil said. I think I've got one of yours here. His story checks out. Must have been a mix-up. The devil nodded as a voice on the phone spoke back to him. He gave the old man a silent celebratory thumbs up as the voice continued. The devil covered the phone speaker with his hand, turned to the old man and said, You're all good. They just want to know where you were when you died, the place which you remember the last time before you landed at my gate. The old man nodded. Oh, that's easy. I was at Disneyland. <laughs> In our fourth funny story of the day, we bring you two friends that have to go and identify their friend Patty at the morgue. In today's side-splitting saga, prepare to embark on a journey where reality takes a detour down the winding road of absurdity. Patty's misfortune sets the stage for a rib-tickling escapade that'll have you questioning if you've stumbled into a comedy sketch by accident. So fasten your seatbelts, folks, because this joke is about to whisk you away on a whirlwind of hilarity. 
Stay tuned. Patty, bless his charred soul, found himself in quite the predicament after meeting an untimely demise in a fiery blaze. Now, imagine the scene. Flames dancing, smoke billowing, and poor Patty left roasted to a crisp. It was the kind of situation that would have made even the most seasoned mortician break into a cold sweat. Enter the morgue, that eerie sanctuary where human remains are stored like frozen dinners, waiting for their turn to meet their maker. In modern times, these macabre establishments have upgraded their facilities to include refrigeration units, ensuring that corpses stay fresh longer than your last grocery haul. Now, as fate would have it, Patty's two best pals, Seamus and Sean, were tasked with the unenviable job of identifying their dear friend's charred remains. Armed with a morbid curiosity and perhaps a hint of trepidation, they stepped into the morgue, ready to confront the grim reality of Patty's demise. Seamus, always the brave soul, took the lead as the mortician, a seasoned veteran in the art of anatomical pathology, revealed Patty's charred form beneath the cold, sterile sheet. Seamus remarked with a grimace. Yup, he's burnt pretty bad, roll him over. Now let's pause for a moment to appreciate the etymology of our morbid fascination. The term mortuary traces its roots back to medieval times, originating from the Anglo-French word mortuary, which referred to a gift from a deceased parishioner to their local priest. Meanwhile, morgue has French origins, once describing a section of a prison reserved for newly arrived inmates. As Seamus and the mortician turned poor Patty's body, a sense of dread lingered in the air like the faint scent of formaldehyde. But alas, Seamus shook his head in disbelief. Nope, it ain't Patty, he declared leaving the mortician scratching his head in confusion. Undeterred by his friend's puzzling proclamation, Sean stepped up to the plate, ready to lend his discerning eye to the task at hand. With a mixture of solemnity and gallows humor, Sean assessed the charred figure before him. Yep, he's burnt really bad. But as Sean examined the remains more closely and rolled him over, a realization dawned upon him like a bolt of lightning on a stormy night. No, it ain't Patty, he announced his voice tinged with a hint of amusement. Perplexed beyond measure, the mortician couldn't help but inquire, How can you tell? And in that moment, Sean delivered the punchline with the finesse of a seasoned stand-up comedian. Well, Patty had two arseholes. He proclaimed with unwavering confidence, leaving the mortician utterly flabbergasted. What, he had two arseholes? The mortician exclaimed, his mind reeling with disbelief. Sean replied, a mischievous twinkle in his eye. Yep. Everyone knew he had two arseholes. Every time we went into town, folks would say, here comes Patty with them two arseholes. <laughs> In our second last funny story of the day, this guy gets stuck next to the road at night when a ghost car appears. Very funny. In today's funny story joke, we meet Bill, a man facing a dark night a fierce rainstorm, and perhaps even darker thoughts about life's mysteries. As he stands there, soaked and shivering, he contemplates the afterlife. Yes, that's right. We're diving deep into the existential pool from the get-go. According to various belief systems, our consciousness might just continue after our physical form bites the dust. But hold on to your umbrellas, folks, because Bill's night is about to take a turn for the absurd. Bill was on the side of the road hitchhiking on a very dark night in the midst of a fierce rainstorm. The night was rolling on and no car went by. The storm was so strong he could hardly see a few meters ahead of him. As he stood there, soaked and shivering, he began to ponder life's great mysteries, particularly the concept of the afterlife or life after death. According to various belief systems, the essential part of an individual's consciousness or identity continues to exist after the death of their physical body. In some views, this continued existence takes place in a spiritual realm, while in others, the individual may be reborn into this world, beginning the life cycle over again through reincarnation. Suddenly, through the swirling rain, Bill saw a car slowly coming towards him. As it drew level with him, it stopped. 
desperate for shelter and without really thinking about what he was doing, Bill got into the back seat of the car and closed the door. That was when he realized there was nobody behind the wheel and the engine wasn't even on. Mysteriously and soundlessly, the car started moving slowly forward. Bill looked at the road and saw a curve approaching. Now he was scared and began to fear for his life. Just before he reached the curve, a ghostly hand appeared through the window of the car and turned the steering wheel. This eerie sight made him think of the 1990 film Ghost, where the protagonist, played by Patrick Swayze, navigates the afterlife as a spirit on Earth to protect his beloved girlfriend and solve the mystery of his murder. Sam's spirit world interactions in the film illustrated a form of spiritual continuation where his essence remained active, much like the ghostly hand that was now steering the car. Bill, paralyzed with terror, watched how the hand appeared every time they came to a curve. The experience reminded him of various religious beliefs where spirits linger to complete unfinished business, reflecting both the emotional and metaphysical aspects of life after death. Bill's mind raced through different afterlife concepts, heaven, hell, reincarnation, and now, apparently, ghost chauffeurs. When he saw the lights of a pub down the road, Bill gathered all his bravery and strength, jumped out of the car, and ran to the pub. Wet and out of breath, he burst through the doors like a man possessed and shouted, I need two shots of scotch, pronto. The bartender, seeing the wild look in Bill's eyes, obliged without question. Shaking and half crying, Bill began telling everybody about the horrible experience he had just been through. A silence enveloped everybody when they realized he was not drunk, but was for real. One old timer in the corner, who had seen his fair share of strange things, muttered, I've heard of ghost stories, but this is something else. About 10 minutes later, two guys walked into the same pub. They were also wet and out of breath, looking like they had run a marathon through a car wash. Seeing Bill sobbing at the bar, one said to the other, Hey Bruce, isn't that the idiot who got in the car while we were pushing it? <laughs> in our last funny story of the day, we bring you a cake mishap at a church bazaar. Like promised, we left the best for last. But before we get going on our last story, I would like to thank you for watching our creations. If you liked it, then please press the subscribe button and the bell icon underneath this video, and you will be notified when our next videos become live. Okay, folks, here goes with our last story of the day. In today's funny story joke, we're about to dive into a tale brimming with twists, historical quirks, and a plot twist that will leave you in stitches. Imagine a Victorian charity bazaar, a determined baker, and a cake with a secret so shocking it could make a bishop choke on his tea. What could possibly go wrong? Buckle up, because this one's a roller coaster you won't want to miss. Imagine Victorian England, a land where fainting couches were a must-have furniture item and gossip traveled faster than a handsome cab on a cobblestone street. Back then, raising money wasn't some flashy telethon with a sweaty man in a headset begging you to call a 1-800 number. Oh no, it was a delightful absurdity called a charity bazaar or fancy fair if you were feeling particularly posh. Think of it as a gossip convention crashing head-on with an arts and crafts market with a healthy dose of questionable homemade goods like crocheted teapot cozies that wouldn't keep a teacup warm for a penguin in the Arctic. Critics, bless their perpetually furrowed brows, scoffed at these sham products, arguing they stole business from proper shops. But honestly, who could resist a good cause, especially when it involved ladies in bustles the size of hot air balloons showing off their, ahem, unique needlepoint skills? Let's just say some of those embroidered handkerchiefs looked less like delicate flowers and more like psychedelic sea monsters escaped from a sailor's rum-induced nightmare. But hey, that was the charm of the charity bazaar, a delightful blend of philanthropy, questionable crafts, 
and enough social gossip to fuel a season of Netflix period dramas. In the quaint town of Whitby, nestled by the ever-churning sea, lived Aunt San, a baking legend. Her scones were rumored to cure the vapors, and her pies were so good they could make a vicar reconsider celibacy, though such thoughts were never uttered aloud, of course. But disaster struck the night before the annual church bazaar, like a rogue fog rolling in off the North Sea. Her masterpiece, a fruitcake destined to be the centerpiece of the event, decided to impersonate a pancake. Time was flatter than the cake itself, and Aunt San, resourceful as any Victorian lady, hatched a plan as ingenious as it was likely to land her in social Siberia. Picture this, a majestic cake, a frosted Goliath ready to conquer the taste buds of Whitby. But beneath this sugary facade lurked a secret darker than a chimney sweep's fingernails. Nestled in the center, like a throne fit for a porcelain monarch, was a toilet roll, a royal imposter indeed, a thick layer of icing sugar applied with the trowel-like grace of a nervous bricklayer, became the imposter king's royal cloak. Aunt San, with the confidence of a magician about to pull a live badger out of a top hat, though such a feat would be wildly inappropriate for a church bazaar. Deep down, she knew she might have to resort to buying her own creation back, because let's be honest, who else in their right mind would spend good money on a pastry that looked like it could give a toilet a complex? The morning of the bazaar dawned, and faster than you can say charity case, Aunt San's cake vanished like a magician's handkerchief, snatched up quicker than a vicar caught eyeing a barmaid's ankle. Panic seized Aunt San tighter than a corset on a particularly large lady who just discovered her favorite gossip was a complete fabrication. Who, in their right mind, had bought this potential pastry-based projectile. The next few hours were an agonizing waiting game, each social interaction a potential landmine of icing-covered shame. Every time someone complimented the luscious fruitcake, Aunt San felt like fainting dead away, a prospect that would have only caused more suspicion given the current state of her baked goods. The following day, fate would have its delicious way with Aunt San, she found herself at tea with her dear friend Clara. As the tea tray arrived, Aunt San felt her composure crumble faster than a custard tart at a picnic. There it sat, in all its glory, or lack thereof, the cake, the toilet roll throne, and all. But before she could confess her bakery blunder, Clara, bless her unsuspecting soul, beamed and declared, Aunt San, time to enjoy the cake. I slaved two days over. In our first joke of the day, we bring you a heaven for women and a heaven for men. Very funny. In today's jocular tale, prepare for an uproarious journey of celestial comedy. This whimsical story will whisk you through heavenly towns on a quest for the perfect husband, ending with a twist that's delightfully droll. Get ready for a laugh-out-loud adventure like no other. Has anybody heard about the new place in heaven? It's called the Husband World. You can go there and find yourself a husband. There are six towns in heaven where this store exists, each representing a level of desirability. You can only visit each town one time, though and each town you go to, the value increases. You may choose any husband from a particular town, but you cannot go to another town and then come back. So there was a woman named Sarah who went to the husband store to find herself a husband. In the first town, Cloudsville, the sign on the door read, these men have jobs. Hmm, not bad. Sarah thought. But I need to see what else is out there. So she moved on. In the second town, Angel Falls, the sign said, these men have jobs and love kids. Better. She mused. But let's see what's next. In the third town, Halo Heights, the sign said, these men have jobs, love kids, and are extremely good looking. Wow, that's impressive. She thought. But I'm compelled to go on to the next town. 
She goes to the fourth town, Seraphim Springs, and the sign reads, these men have jobs, love kids, are drop-dead good-looking, and they help with the housework. Oh, mercy me, Sarah said. I can hardly stand it, but I have got to go on. She went to the fifth town, Cherubim Creek. The sign said, these men have jobs, love kids, are drop-dead good-looking, help with the housework, and have a very strong romantic streak. This is almost too good to be true, she exclaimed but I must see what the final town has to offer. She finally arrived in the sixth town, Paradise Plains. The sign read, you are visitor number 31,456 to this town. There are no men here. This town exists solely as proof that women are impossible to please. But this funny story isn't over yet. There is also a place for men. It's called the Wife Store. It exists in six towns as well. Only thing is, Men only ever visit the first town. Want to know why? In the first town, Blissville, the sign says, these women are good at housework, and you can go fishing, watch TV, eat whatever you want, and the woman will make it for you. You can be as messy as you want, and she will clean up behind you. As one man exited the store with a wide grin, another man entering asked, Hey buddy, how's the wife you got from the wife store? Fantastic. But what about the other towns? What do they offer? The man looked puzzled and said, Why would I care? I got everything I need in Blissville. Who needs to explore further? And thus, men proved that sometimes simple pleasures are all they need, while women, well, they enjoy a good challenge. The twist? The next day, Heaven opened a new store, the Feedback Store, women could finally voice what they wanted. Surprisingly, they all demanded a return policy for the husband's store, and the men, well, they asked for earplugs. <laughs> In our second funny story joke of the day, we bring you animals having a chat on a farm. Get ready for an uproarious comedy story that's about to unfold. In today's funny joke, we're diving into a barnyard brawl between a pig, sheep, and cows. This comedic showdown promises to deliver laughs galore. Stay tuned as the hilarity unfolds. It's a tale guaranteed to leave you laughing out loud. It was a sunny day, the sun shining so brightly that even the chickens were wearing sunglasses. Inside the barn, Amid this idyllic weather, a storm is about to break loose looking like a double-sided weather day. The farm animals were deep in a heated debate, not about how lovely the day was, but about who had the worst deal in life. Just then, the sheep entered the barn with their usual solemn expressions, casting long shadows across the hay-strewn floor. The chickens paused mid-squabble to eye them suspiciously. The cows and pigs were embroiled in a heated, who has it worst competition. The cows were first to plead their case. We feel utterly used, milked and then tossed into the fields like yesterday's news. Said Henriette, the eldest cow. The pigs with mischievous grins countered. Oh, but we lead the life of kings. We party, feast and lounge around all day. Indignant, the cows shot back. Sure, you may party, but we're left alone in the fields with the wolves. And to top it off, our calves do not even get our milk. Farmers drinking it. Our little calves are forced to grow up so fast, my poor little babies. The pigs unfazed retorted, Not our problem. Look at us, plump and pampered. We even have our own muddy spa that we of course use every second of the day. Just then, Bertram the bull barged in dramatically. You think you have it tough. Every year, I have to impregnate at least six cows to keep the legacy going. It's such hard work. You know some bulls have trouble dodging the right bullet to impregnate a cow at this age. Then I'm roped into bull fights. It's so exhausting. We don't get the money if we win the fight. The piglets, still gleeful, snorted. Oh, but wouldn't you rather be a pig? Basking in the sun, becoming a beautiful blush pink? 
Not to be outdone, the sheep finally spoke up. And what about us? Left shivering in the fields, our beautiful wool stripped away for the farmer's fancy clothes. And when we're not good enough, off to the slaughter we go. And when we have little lambs, they are forced to grow up alone in fields for the same reason. They are always so tired, it ain't fun for a mother to see that. The barn fell silent as each animal pondered the other's plight. The pigs, nonchalant as ever, declared, Well, at least we live it up and grow big and strong. I mean, look at our muscles. But this conversation was far from over. It was gearing up for a funny joke finale that would hit like a double shot of espresso after a pig's breakfast. The sheep fixed them with a steely glare. You know why you pigs think you've got the best life? Ever notice how your buddies mysteriously vanish around Christmas? The pig's eyes bulged with sudden understanding as the sheep leaned in, her voice dropping to a dramatic whisper. Oh yes, the farmer fattens you up like royalty for the grand holiday chase, which is kind of like a comedy show. And when he finally catches you, boom, your pal becomes the star attraction of a lavish festive feast, complete with glazed honey and an apple in its mouth. <laughs> Now we bring you a funny story joke about a man that loves his golf and an ambidextrous golfer. This hilariously funny joke is about a golf lover's encounter with a then stranger in a small town with a hilarious ending. Watch to the end to find out. John, a man whose love for golf rivaled only his questionable fashion sense, think Argyle socks with plaid shorts, was on a business trip. Now, John wasn't one to let a perfectly good fairway go to waste. Wherever his travels took him, his golf clubs were his ever-present companions, like a slightly more cumbersome security blanket. This time, John found himself in a town so small, the pigeons knew everyone by name. Determined to avoid a day filled with staring contests with blades of grass, John embarked on a quest to find a golfing buddy. He started with the receptionist at his hotel, a woman perpetually swaddled in a cardigan that seemed knitted from the dreams of accountants. No dice. He then accosted the bellhop, a teenager with a perpetually bewildered expression who pointed him towards the rusty nail, the town's only watering hole, and possibly its only source of entertainment. The rusty nail was a symphony of dim lighting, sticky floors, and patrons whose best days were likely behind them. There, perched on a bar stool that seemed to be contemplating retirement, sat Harry. Now, Harry had a face like a road map etched by too much whiskey and not enough sunscreen, and a laugh that could curdle milk at 50 paces. John, ever the optimist, saw potential. Fancy a game of golf tomorrow, mate? John inquired, his most charming smile plastered on his face. Harry, after a thorough examination of John's attire that could double as a warning sign for hazardous materials, shrugged. All right, why not? Nine o'clock sharp. But I might be a half an hour late. He punctuated the statement with a cough that sounded suspiciously like a rusty hinge. John, a man of punctuality, unless a particularly loud sports channel was on, arrived at the course the next morning at 9 a.m., practically vibrating with anticipation. There, leaning nonchalantly against a golf cart, was Harry, swinging a left-handed golf club with the grace of a flamingo on ice skates. John blinked, then blinked again, was he hallucinating from the questionable breakfast pastry he'd inhaled on the way over? The game, however, was anything but a hallucination. Harry, despite the left-handed handicap, or perhaps because of it, played like a man possessed. He sunk putts with a nonchalance that bordered on arrogance, and his drives were laser-focused bolts of pure, unadulterated luck. Fancy a game of golf tomorrow again, mate? John inquired, again with a smile plastered on his face. All right, why not? Nine o'clock sharp. But I might be a half an hour late. He again punctuated the statement with the same rustic cough. The next day, 
As the previous day, Harry was there at 9 a.m., sharp, leaning nonchalantly against a golf cart. Now, this wouldn't have been remarkable, except that this time, Harry was swinging a right-handed golf club, again with the grace of a flamingo on ice skates. The game, however, was anything but a hallucination. Harry, despite the right-handed handicap, or perhaps because of it, John wasn't sure what to believe anymore, played like a man possessed. He sunk putts with a nonchalance that bordered on arrogance, and his drives were laser-focused bolts of pure, unadulterated luck. By the 18th hole, John was a man utterly bewildered. Listen, Harry. He began, wiping sweat from his brow, brought on more by confusion than exertion. That was impressive. But the left-handed clubs, and then right-handed clubs, what gives? Harry, wiping a suspicious tear from his eye, brought on by laughter, John eventually realized, chuckled. Ah, that's simple. You see, mate, it all depends on how the missus sleeps. John, ever the curious soul, leaned in. Right, Harry said, a mischievous glint in his eye. If she wakes up on her left side, I take the lefty clubs. Right side? Righties it is. Makes things interesting, wouldn't you say? John, still trying to process this bizarre domestic strategy, blurted out, But what if she's on her back? Well, that, my friend, is when I am a half an hour late. Harry's grin widened to alarming proportions. <laughs> now, our second last funny story joke of the week, we bring you a man that is tired of his wife's diet and decides to go on a hunting trip. In today's uproarious yarn of comedic genius, get ready for a tornado through a rib-tickling, side-splitting, laugh-out-loud funny story joke that guarantees to have you doubled over with laughter. Get set for a rollicking journey into this hilarious and amusing tale. There was an uncle, let's call him Marvin, who slowly started to realize his wife, Agnes, was waging a war on his taste buds and waistline. Remember Marvin? The guy who used to wake up to a steaming mug of coffee now faced a cup of green tea so green it could win an award for most likely to make you look like Shrek. Even the cat wouldn't touch the stuff. Breakfast used to be a glorious mess of crumble pap and leftover meat. Now, gluten-free biscuits that even the family cockatiel eyed with suspicion. Lunch was a hearty bready, a South African stew that warmed your soul. Now powdered eggs that tasted like sadness in a cup. Marvin felt like he was being slowly whittled down, one healthy bite at a time. Then, salvation or so he thought arrived. A phone call from a buddy about a hunting trip. This was Marvin's chance to escape Agnes's health crusade. He grabbed his hunting gear, scribbled a hastily written, I love you, on the toilet paper because, apparently, love notes weren't part of the new health plan, and bolted. The hunting trip was a carnivore's dream. Fatty meats so tough they could blunt a diamond, mountains of sausage that left his mouth glistening like a disco ball in a heat wave. Marvin reveled in the greasy, glorious freedom. He ate enough to feed a small village, his stomach becoming a battlefield with every bite. Ten days later, Marvin returned home a changed man. Well, a wider man. Bending over to tie his shoes became an Olympic event, a battle between his gut and his limited flexibility. He knew he needed a plan, and fast. But this uproarious comedy ain't over. Desperate, Marvin flipped through Agnes's magazines, his eyes landing on an ad. Lose 11 pounds in five days. Canadian approved. This was it. He ripped out the page, dialed the number, and a friendly voice answered. Hello, this is the Canadian Approved Diet Service. How can I help you lose weight, eh? Marvin explained his situation and the voice continued. This is a simple plan, eh? Pay $12 and we'll send you a diet packet within 48 hours. Guaranteed results. Two days later, the doorbell rang. Marvin opened the door, expecting a pamphlet or maybe a motivational poster. Instead, 
A stunning woman with a figure that could launch a thousand ships stood before him. If you can catch me. She winked. I'm yours. And with that, she bolted. Marvin, fueled by a combination of surprise and newfound motivation, chased after her like a man possessed. He ran through the house, down the street, his lungs burning, his legs screaming in protest. Five days later, Marvin had shed 11 pounds. He was a changed man, again, this time for the better. He could eat somewhat normally again, and his taste buds weren't permanently assaulted by green tea. Two weeks flew by, and the weight loss bug bit Marvin again. He called the service, the woman reappeared, another chase ensued, and another 15 pounds vanished. The cycle continued, yet this funny story ain't done. Every time a vacation or special event loomed, Marvin dialed the number. But this time, things took a turn. The doorbell rang, and instead of a beautiful woman, a giant, muscle-bound man with a scowl that could curdle milk stood there. If I catch you... He growled. You're mine. Marvin, his eyes widening in horror, took off like a rocket. He ran faster than he ever thought possible, fueled by pure terror. Five days later, Marvin was a shadow of his former self, and he lost 28 pounds. <laughs> now, in our last funny story of the week, we bring you three mercenaries jailed and in solitary confinement. But before we go, we would like to thank you so much for watching our funny story joke compilation. If you like this type of videos, then please press the subscribe button and the bell icon. This way you will get notified as we publish new content. Here we go with our last funny story of the day. In today's funny story joke, prepare yourself for an uproarious tale of comedy and misfortune. This story will have you in fits of laughter as we explore the hilarious misadventures of three soldiers and their unique choices. Get ready for a joke that's not just funny, but a comedy masterpiece that promises to keep you giggling all the way through. Three Soldiers of Fortune, a stiff upper lip Englishman named Bartholomew, a whiskey-loving Irishman named Seamus, and a chain-smoking Frenchman named Pierre found themselves in a sticky situation. Mercenaries in a foreign land gone wrong, they were captured and sentenced to a year of solitary confinement. Facing a year of solitary confinement, the judge, in a rare display of something resembling amusement, or perhaps just sheer boredom, offered them a twisted form of leniency. Each of you, he declared, his voice dripping with a sickly sweet foe kindness, may choose one luxury item to accompany you for the duration of your sentence. Consider it a parting gift, before a year of utter isolation, of course. Bartholomew the Englishman, whose idea of excitement was a perfectly creased tie, adjusted his monocle and puffed out his chest. I say a year's supply of the finest English gin, wouldn't you agree? After all, a gentleman needs his tonic. The judge, suppressing a snort of laughter, noted down Bartholomew's request. He then turned to Seamus, whose bloodshot eyes and disheveled beard spoke volumes about his preferred tipple. Seamus, his face perpetually fixed in a wide, hopeful grin, bellowed, A year's supply of the finest, smoothest, most soul-warming Irish whiskey, Your Honor. A true Irishman's solace in times of, well, times like this, wouldn't you say? The judge, ever the stickler for rules, made a show of writing down Seamus' request before turning to Pierre, the Frenchman whose constant cigarette smoke practically formed a permanent halo around his head. Pierre, looking distinctly less cool than usual, a feat most thought impossible, rasped out his request in a voice hoarse from a year of non-stop smoking. Just a crate of the finest French cigarettes, Monsieur Le Juge. He croaked. The judge, his cruel amusement bubbling over, readily agreed. After all, what else could a man possibly need for a year of solitary confinement, right? But this story joke is not over yet. Stay tuned, because the real punchline is about to hit. 
After the 12 months are up, the judge returns to release the prisoners. He opens the door to the Englishman's cell, and the Englishman hobbles out, bleary-eyed and weak, and says, I'm finally free. Before collapsing and succumbing to alcohol poisoning right on the spot. Next, they head to the Irishman's cell. They open the door, and the Irishman scuffles out, his eyes bloodshot, his steps unsteady. Free at last, he mumbles taking a few shaky steps before straightening himself and slowly walking towards freedom. Finally, the judge approaches the Frenchman's cell. He opens the door and out steps the Frenchman, looking utterly disheveled, his clothes in tatters. He takes a few shaky steps forward, raises his hands and pleads desperately. Please, please, does anyone have a lighter or matches? If you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here.